When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. That our entire life is meant to be one where we are constantly repenting of our sins. It's not a once and done. It is not a set it and forget it. It is not something that happens just a single time in your life and then you never have to worry about repentance. No, if you are a follower of Christ, you are well aware of the fact that every single day of your life, you still sin and therefore must repent of that sin. That there is still this necessity of repenting from sin. And that ultimately, our entire life here on the earth, if we are faithful followers of Jesus Christ, seeking to live our lives for his glory, then we need, we must, we will be every day regularly, constantly repenting of our sins. And so as we begin a new semester, as we launch into the fall semester of 2023, as some of you are back in school, others of you are working full time and didn't really notice that the clock ticked over to the fall semester, except because it's really nice outside and the weather is wonderful. And I love this hint of fall that we seem to be getting and I enjoy it very much. But whether it be the pumpkin spice lattes and other such things that are now for sale, or it be college football starting tomorrow, or whatever it is that's a signifier for you of the fall beginning, as we start a new fall semester together, I want to both challenge you and encourage you. That I want to challenge and encourage you that when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed that your entire life, if you are his, is to be one of repentance each and every day. So turn with me to Romans chapter 6. I've been studying the book of Romans just in my own personal time of study, and one verse, the last verse of our passage that we're looking at, it arrested me as I was studying it and, and enjoying the opportunity to really share with you this verse and to both challenge you, challenge you and encourage you from it. So Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 8. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, he says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin, he died once. That for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. If we honestly evaluate ourselves, if we look at our lives and we recognize them as they truly are, we must confess that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. Sin comes naturally to us. If you serve at Family Weekend with the infants or the toddlers, you will see that sin does not wait until you are older or even really able to speak. It begins at the very beginning. We have been sinning quite naturally since we were infants. But there is hope to be set free from sin to be set free in Christ. That hope we see in verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And verse 11, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Death no longer has dominion over Christ. Christ died once for all. And he lives, continues to live, lives continually to God. And that 
truth that Christ died once for sin, that he died once for all and now lives and will continue to live for eternity. Speaking of him as a man, as God, he is always and forever will live. But Christ as man, he died once for sin, but now he lives and will never die again. That same truth of Christ never will die again. That is offered and equated to us if we are in Christ. That just as Christ died once, if we die with him, we will live forever. We will be freed from the penalty, from the pain, from the suffering, from the slavery of sin. But that promise of being free from the dominion of sin, it is a conditional promise. It assumes it right there at the beginning of our passage. If you have died with Christ, then you will also live with him. So how can you be confident in victory over sin? How can you begin to have Victory over sin. Well, it begins with point number one, dying with Christ. Die with Christ. Have you done this? Have you died with Christ? Is your life now hidden in his? And really, this is, there's two senses in which we need to die with Christ. They're both essential for Christians. I'm skipping ahead there. Both of these are essential as Christians. The first is a singular death. It is a punctiliar death, if we want to get strangely grammatical. It is a death that happens once at a specific time. That is when we die with Christ in submission to him as Lord. And when we die to ourselves and begin to live with Christ, when we are made a new creation, the old has passed away, behold, the new has come. That that is a singular event that happens in the life of each and every follower of Christ, where we go from death to life, where we die in Christ and our life is hidden with Christ in God, and then we long for the day, we look forward to that day when Christ, who is our life, when he appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. Have you repented of your sins, died to yourself, to your desires, to your pleasure, to your lordship, to your autonomy, and submitted to Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you turned from the sin that enslaves you and leads to death and turned toward Christ, your only hope in life and death? Have you responded to the gospel, to the good news? That though God is holy and the creator of all things and is just and therefore must pour out his wrath upon sin, which means that his wrath must be poured out on sinners, on those who commit sin. Have you accepted the free gift of Christ as your substitutionary atonement, the one who has paid the price for your sins? Have you submitted to him as Savior? Yes, he is our Savior, and praise God that we have a Savior in Christ Jesus, but he is also our Lord. This is no simple get out of hell free card. Oops, I messed up. I'll turn this in and then go and live as I have felt. No, this is a decision to submit to Christ as the Lord over your life, for your whole life. Does Christ call the shot? Do you submit to him? I've told some of you this before, that verse, Colossians 3, 3, for you have died is something God kind of just hit me in the face with when I was a junior in college, recognizing my own arrogance and pride and recognizing that the things that I was taking pride in, my good works, my good behavior, 
were ultimately things that Christ was doing in me because I had died to sin. My life was hidden in Christ. Have you turned to Christ as Lord and Savior? If not, then today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to respond. Today is the day to die to sin, to die with Christ. I believe it's been said that we get, we can either die in this life to ourselves or we will spend eternity in death. And we have one shot in this life to make that decision. We have this life to choose and then eternity to reap the repercussions or rewards thereunto. Have you turned to Christ? Have you died with Christ? No one has always been a Christian. No believer was one from infancy. They have, you have all, if you are in Christ, made a decision to turn to him, seeking him, submitting to him as Lord and Savior. If you have never done that, if sin still has dominion over your life, then let today be the day of salvation. Talk to one of your leaders. Talk to one of the people sitting at the table with you. Speak to someone tonight. Do not leave here tonight without having made that commitment to Christ as Lord and Savior. Because he is a good and gracious and wonderful Savior, taking the payment of all of our sin, the entirety of our life, all of the sin, the sin that we have committed and we will commit until the day that we die and go to be with our Lord. Christ offers full payment for each and every one, for those who turn from their sin and trust in him as Lord and Savior. Receive that good gift if you have not. But again, this isn't just a one and done thing. No, the entirety of your life is meant to be a life of repentance. We are saved at a moment, but every day we are to die to ourselves. Paul goes on later in Romans in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That This is the ongoing act of a believer, that each and every day you offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God to live your life not for yourself, but for Christ. Knowing this, as Christ said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The abundant life is found in Christ, in dying to yourself and living for him. The old pastor's adage goes that the problem with living sacrifices is they have a tendency to crawl off the altar. And that is something we must constantly, every day, why our entirety of our lives will be one of repentance, of turning back to Christ, of turning to him. Christ himself said in Luke 9, 23, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That every day we would pick up our cross the Roman execution rack, daily dying to ourselves that we might follow Christ. This is the second aspect of dying with Christ. It is a daily dying to our sinful flesh so that we might live to Christ in righteousness. This is what Paul commands in verses 12 and 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That's a command given to every believer. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And so we must mortify our sins. We must live lives of daily repentance. We must grow to be more like Christ each and every day. And so what we need to do is holistically serve God. Point number two, we need to use your whole self to serve 
God. Use your whole self, all of you, every aspect of your life. Use it to serve God, to serve Christ. Paul says to present your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That word there, members, it's literally like your limbs, your arms and legs and hands and feet. To use your physical bodies. They are meant to be instruments for God's glory, as it's translated there, or to be used as weapons for God's glory. The Greek word that's translated instrument there is hoplon, and if you are a military nerd, you would might recognize that coming from the word, or relating to the word hoplite, which was the ancient Greeks soldiers. They were famous for having these round shields, their hoplons, from which they draw their name. They were bounded, they were bowl shape. They used them defensively. They formed into what is referred to as a phalanx, a tight grouping of men with giant spears, and they were some of the greatest soldiers on the battlefield in ancient times, these hoplite soldiers. And their shield was the basis for their fighting style, this word that we translate instrument. Certainly, as it has come into Koine Greek, Hundred, several hundred years later, as it's come into what would be the Greek use at the time of the New Testament, it is being broadened its usage to refer to a tool or a weapon used to engage in something, a tool or weapon to be make ready with. Are we using ourselves? Are we using ourselves as shields for our pet sin? Are we using ourselves as ways to protect us from conviction? Are we hiding behind shields so that we can persist in sinful habits and behaviors? Are we presenting our members as instruments for sin? Or are we using ourselves to cover our hearts from the flaming darts of the evil one? To cover ourselves from the temptation that the world is constantly throwing out at us. Are we disciplining our minds and our bodies that we might pursue holiness and righteousness? Are we disciplining our bodies to be tools and weapons of righteousness? One of the greatest glories of heaven will be that our bodies will by nature seek to do that which is right. It is one of the reasons why we long for eternity, because then we will no longer have to fight against our flesh. Our flesh will work alongside of our spirits to serve God in glory forever, always doing that what is right and delighting in it. That is not so today. We get angry and then our heart starts beating faster. And our face reddens, and we have a physical response of anger. Or we start thinking about big project X that is on the horizon, and we start getting nervous, and our pulse quickens, and our very bodies work against us as we seek to fight anxiety. We struggle with sin that our bodies work against us. We long for the day when that will not be so, but that doesn't excuse us to just say, well, my body's bent for unrighteousness. Say la vie, what are you going to do about it? It does not permit us to then just give in, to pursue that sinfulness and unrighteousness. Instead, we ought to put in that discipline. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, the Apostle Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
you ought to be disciplining yourselves for righteousness absolutely in a spiritual sense of being faithful to be in the word and to be in prayer and practicing the spiritual disciplines but have you considered that your sleep habits put you at greater or lesser risk of committing temptation or committing sin falling into temptation that when you are hungry you tend to get angry when you never deny yourself food, you're not as likely to be ready to deny yourself pleasure. That your physical bodies can be a tool for righteousness if you discipline them so. You can train yourself to take captive your thoughts. We are called to take every cap thought captive for the sake of Christ. Are we actively disciplining ourselves spiritually and physically that we might pursue righteousness? Are we disciplining ourselves to stop with the social media scroll or the YouTube feeds at 11.30 p.m. at night so that we can get up in the morning early to spend time in the Word? Here's a, another classic pastor saying of, the battle for Sunday morning begins on Saturday night. And to broaden that truth, the battle for your morning quiet time begins the night before with getting to bed on time, with not letting that one YouTube video spiral into four hours of YouTube videos, of not letting that one little brief glimpse on Instagram to spiral into several hours later, continuing to troll and scroll. We must discipline ourselves in those things so that we can continue to discipline ourselves for Christ. Something as simple as setting a sleep focus on your phone so that you can't access it after a certain hour so that you then get bored and go to bed so that then you can get up in the morning and do your quiet time and expand your quiet time and spend more time in the Word with God. That simple act of discipline can have a profound knock-on effect in your life. Conversely, if you're simply allowing yourself to pursue those things, you are going to train your body to pursue sinful, selfish pleasures. And it'll be no wonder that you're still continuing to struggle in sin. You need to deny yourself donuts to build muscles to deny yourself sinful desires. Simply put, like if you spend time fasting, fast once a week, fast a meal a, d a week, take one meal out of the week and say, I'm not going to eat lunch on this day. I am instead going to spend that time praying. It's just the simple denial of a meal. And yet that practice of self-denial physically will build muscles that you can use to self-denial spiritually, that the actual practice of physically fasting from something can be a profound tool for increasing the muscles to say no to lust, to say no to anger, to say no to anxiety, because you are building these muscles to deny yourself. It's going to be hard work, and it's daily work. It begins now it begins tonight it will continue tomorrow and it will go on and on until the lord returns or he calls you home it is a lifetime of work we don't get to retire at 65 in the christian life unless the lord calls you home at 65 that would just be ironic there's no retirement age 65 70 92 years old you still must be repenting of sin and seeking to serve Christ. But there's really good news. Just because we must spend an entire lifetime of repenting from sin, it doesn't mean that you must spend an entire lifetime repenting of that sin. Whatever is your sin that you are struggling with the most, whether it be pornography and lust or it be anger whether it be greed and envy, pride. Just because that is a struggle today does not mean that when you're 97 years old in the nursing home, it will still be a struggle. There's actually no need for that. 
don't fight against sin with the assumption that I, that sin is going to stick with me until I am old and buried. No, because you see, you have died with Christ. Therefore, you have died to that sin. Therefore, as Romans 6.14 says, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Point number three, fight with confidence that the fight is won. Fight with confidence that the fight is won. Christ has defeated sin and death and the grave. Christ has won. Christ is reigning and will reign forever. If you are in Christ Jesus, you have the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwelling within you. The Holy Spirit dwells within each and every single believer. As you think of the sin that is the greatest struggle in your life today, do not think that you must therefore struggle with it and suffer against it for the rest of your life. Sin will have no dominion over you. That is a promise in the word of God. Do not fight as if you are defeated. Yes, we must fight sin. We must fight it every single day, but we fight with confidence. We fight with confidence that the war is won, and we fight with confidence because the strength of the one who conquered death is what is given to us through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. It's why this all begins with that conditional, if we have died with Christ, if we have died with Christ, we are hidden in him and his spirit dwells within us. The spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Yes, sin is going to be a battle for our entire lives, but that sin, battling a particular sin does not need to be a life long battle. That struggle with anxiety, Satan wants you to believe that it is something that you will just have to deal with for the rest of your life. But sin will have no dominion over you. It does not rule. Christ does. Christ is the Lord. And that means we must submit to him and obey him and righteousness. But he is Lord. Not your sin, not Satan, not your flesh. Christ is the Lord. If you are in Christ, if you have died to this world that you might live to, for, and through Christ, then you are under grace and this promise is for you. Lift your head, weary sinner, and behold the victorious Lord. Behold the risen King. Cling to the truth of Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it unto completion as far as the day of Christ. That he who started a good work in you, he will not leave it undone. He's not going to run out of funds halfway through the rebuilding of your life and leave it a half-constructed building for people to stare at and wonder for years and years. No, he will bring it to completion. Christ is working in you through the Holy Spirit to sanctify you, to make you more like Christ. You will daily have to fight sin, but the sin you are struggling with today, it has no dominion over you. It will have no dominion over you. Christ will set you free, so fight with confidence. Approach anxiety with the confidence that comes from Christ, with the joy of Scripture, with the power of Scripture that tells you how to fight, to not be anxious in anything, but in everything 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That lust that you are struggling with, flee from sexual immorality as Christ has called us to. But recognize that we have Christ and the Holy Spirit to cleanse our hearts of unrighteousness. Anger, pride, lying, envy. These sins, we must fight. We must actively seek to put them to death. But it's not like we're going up against some impossible opponent. You see this in sports. I think of sports a lot because I played sports. But the difference between a team, an underdog, that approaches a game against a vastly superior-seeming opponent, and the approach of those who lost on the bus ride over, who are like, this is impossible, we don't stand a chance, we're nowhere near as talented as them, and they step out onto the field already defeated. It's as if the scoreboard says 21 nothing before the ball has been kicked off, and it rapidly says 21 nothing as soon as the ball has been kicked off. The game is over before it even started because the team has no confidence, no faith, no consideration that they will ever win the game. Versus those who are able and willing to step up and to oppose that seemingly impossible opponent. And certainly in football, you see teams that are proud and think they might have a chance of upsetting the big dogs, and, well, they still lose in the end because sports stories don't always have a happy ending. But the truth of the Christian life is that that fight is already over. That it may seem that that sin is massive, is a mountain that cannot be climbed, and yet Christ has already defeated sin and death and the grave. The battle has been won. The story is written. The score is settled. It is over. It is only for us to then live in that confidence. It's not a confidence that comes because we're so awesome and are able to overcome these things. The confidence is e extrinsic. It comes from without of ourselves because our confidence is in Christ, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave. That Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ was raised. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He is reigning over all things, and he will return one day to set all things right, to come and restore creation, to redeem all who are in him. And the dead in Christ will rise first. We have confidence in our fight with sin because we know that it is over. But we do have an intrinsic confidence, a confidence within ourselves that's not of ourselves, but is of the Holy Spirit. That we do not have to fight this fight on our own power, in our own strength, because we're doomed if that's the case. But it isn't. But we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. If you have not died with Christ, your fight against sin is a hopeless struggle against the current. But if you have died with Christ, your fight with sin is a fight that Christ has already won. Fight it with that confidence. Approach your struggle with sin with the confidence that comes from Christ reigning on high and the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Use your bodies for the sake of Christ. He will strengthen you so that you may put to death the sin that is so grievously entangling you, so that you may put on the righteousness of Christ, so that you may live for his glory. So let's spend some time in prayer, and let us then praise and glorify the Lord who has set us free from the slavery of sin and death.
God, I thank you for Christ. I thank you for his finished work upon the cross. I thank you for his righteousness that he gives to us, that we may be right in your eyes, not by our own merits or our own work, but by the finished work of Christ. But God, I also thank you that our fight and our struggle and our battle for sanctification, just as our justification is a work of God, is a work of Christ on the cross, that our sanctification is a product, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit working within us. So God, I thank you that we have the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwelling within us. I thank you that we have the hope and the confidence and the surety that sin will have no dominion over us. For We are not under the law, but under grace. We are not slaves to sin. We are slaves to Christ. We are in Christ Jesus. So Lord, I pray for those that do not know you, that today would be the day of salvation that today they would die to themselves, that they might live with Christ, that they would die to sin, that they might live to righteousness. And I pray for those that do know you, that they would fight the fight of sanctification with the confidence that comes from knowing that you, Lord, have conquered sin and death in the grave, and that sin will have no dominion over them. I thank you for these wonderful truths. And we ask these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.